So I do want to briefly introduce uh, Risk Zero, if people aren't familiar with it. Um, our job here at Risk Zero is to make ZK computing easy for everyone, and we've primarily done that to date by introducing a general purpose ZK VM. So it's based on the RISC-V microarchitecture, which means it can run programs written in normal languages, so Rust, C++, Go, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's been around for about a year, and um, yeah, uh, we're mostly based in Seattle. It's based on Starks. So you should check it out. There's lots of cool examples. Um, just very quickly for people who maybe don't know how ZKVMs work, you take your code, uh, some kind of compiler turns it into some kind of image, and then that code actually acts as input to your circuit. Your circuit is a micro, you know, a VM or an actual microcontroller. It interprets the input, um, which is a program, runs it, and then produces a ZK proof. So, uh, so another thing we're working on, oh, I got these slides in the wrong order. Um, <laughs> So uh, the most recent thing we've been working on that we're launching here at ETH Denver is called Bonsai. And this is basically a ZK coprocessor or accelerator for any chain. It basically lets you write your complicated logic in a normal programming language, run it off chain uh, using our ZK VM. And then we have a bunch of machinery to sort of uh, port those proofs back onto whatever chain you're using. So we have an example, Clob. The source isn't open for it quite yet. Um, but you can play with Bonsai if you go to a link. I'll show people later. But um, by using this sort of ZK offloading technique, you're able to uh, yeah, achieve basically 100 times cheaper compute for things like central limit order books directly on Ethereum. And in fact, at least with this design, uh, some, some swaps are cheaper using a Clob than, than Uniswap. Yeah, just an example of how much cheaper that kind of stuff is. Um, this is just like one weird example that I'm gonna kind of talk about briefly leading into the main sort of content of the talk. Um, and that's, this is an example of code you can run in the ZKVM that basically lets you prove that you know uh, that there is a checkmate in a chessboard by importing a chess library that somebody else wrote in Rust. This is an example of having public input and a private input, which is you know, a move that results in checkmate, and then this program sort of produces a proof of it. So this is an example of uh, the kinds of complexity of programs you can currently run in our ZKVM. Um, however, so you can run programs like this, and you can you know, build a clob, but there's a lot of uh, sort of barriers to uh, ZK really living up to its full potential. So I think of these as um, sort of the key technological enablers that are going to allow the most interesting ZK use cases to really um, come to fruition. So ZK compute parity, to, that, to, to me, what I mean by that is um, the ability to actually run any program that you could run on a normal computer in a ZK context. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is kind of a toy program. At some point, we need to get to a place where any program that you might imagine can be run in ZK. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's useful in a bit. So, ZK identity or DID uh, is, you know, massively important for a lot of reasons, but I think one of the most important reasons um, it's useful is because it allows identities to be um, to be scarce again. So uh, online, you know, right now it's very easy to buy bots, create socks, and these have various detrimental effects. Um, ZKML, I think, is going to be critical for any number of use cases in this space, um, along with uh, being able to actually build these sort of decentralized cloud computing environments. This is like AWS where the users are everybody here. You could easily imagine if you had sufficiently powerful ZK, everybody here could just be running a ZK sort of cloud agent on their phone, and we could have a you know, very complete cloud computing infrastructure just here in, in this venue. Um, the creation of server-grade ZK hardware is going to be uh, important for some of these use cases that I talk about. 
um, as well as, and this is like one I don't hear a lot of people talk about, I think low power ZK hardware for um, embedded devices. Uh, along with sort of ZK, it has a lot of friends in the cryptography space that when it's combined with them, I think enable a lot more use cases as well. So this would be FHE, MPC, the new kinds of ZK, MPC that are coming out, et cetera. Similarly, like formal methods and static analysis and figuring out like whether your code is actually written, because ZK will tell you whether your code ran correctly. It won't tell you anything about whether you created the correct code. So it's a lot more useful if you also have tools to help you understand that you've built you know, the thing you intended to build. Okay, so one use case that I think people here have talked about and are probably familiar with is this idea of building new social platforms. So this would be replacing uh, Twitter or Reddit. And this really, in order to kind of build, you know, <clears throat> I kind of feel bad that Twitter had its moment, you know, when it did, if it just waited a couple years, we could have replaced it with decentralized technology. Um, <laughs> so in order to make these kind of platforms, you really need this kind of ZK compute parity um, in order to like run ZKML to do a bunch of the sort of content filtering moderation that you wanna be able to do, um, as well as, uh, you know, sort of control governance and allow voting on moderation. So, I mean, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the amount of moderators Facebook employs, and it's actually one of the most, men like, <clears throat> bad for your brain jobs you can have is to be a Facebook moderator. So it'd be really nice if we could smooth out the work of sort of uh, figuring out, you know, whether content should be permissible in a certain community. Um, but, you know, you want to have recourse, and it's very hard to do that in a sane way without having a very solid ZK identity system built up. And similarly, you want to automate as much of that moderation as possible. And by building up ZKML systems to sort of pre-filter content and suggest content, you'll actually be able to get to a place where, yeah, you could build a non-toxic social network. <clears throat> I think this, uh, sort of building on that, you know, you could, so you could build ZK Twitter or ZK Reddit on top of AWS or GCP or any of these things. Um, you might not want to do that, though. Instead, you might want to actually build it on top of a cloud platform that's run by its users. So I think this, I was just sort of talking about this earlier, this is the idea that any com community of people can basically power the infrastructural needs of its users by allowing them to run the computations for this distributed application. So you can imagine, like, lots of people are launching central bank digital currencies. Um, I think it's kind of crazy to think that, you know, maybe Brazil will launch this, and then the infrastructure that powers their entire like digital currency for their country might be run on you know AWS GovCloud or something like that. You know, really to to achieve like the level of sort of robustness you'd want out of any kind of very you know solid, stable currency system, you really want it to never go down, and you don't want it to be subject to any kind of whims of you know the entity that's not you. So I really think that. ZK-powered um, decentralized clouds will be critical for situations like this. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, similarly uh, for various games and then also uh, yeah, building applications like this and DAO governance platforms and uh, you know who knows what other kinds of applications. It's really useful if you don't need to set up an Amazon account and uh, pay for a bunch of infrastructure if you can just have that infrastructure be provided by your, your users, which ZK makes possible because your users can't lie about you know, what's happening inside your game. So uh, this one I'm very excited about, and I don't know how many people like, have really thought about this or talk about it, but the idea that you can use ZK to secure software supply chains. So there's a lot of very prominent hacks that have been published where you know, software gets injected into a stack that's running on some very important bit of hardware and then does the wrong thing and you know, identity theft and all kinds of badness ensues. So if you have ZK compute parity, you can actually run a compiler in ZK. And so you could take a compiler that's highly audited and then run that compiler in ZK to compile 
the compiler. So now you have a compiler binary that you know uh, was compiled correctly. And then you can use that ZK compiled compiler to compile more programs in ZK, <laughs> which gives you like libraries you can trust. Now, you know, you can trust them to do what's on the tin, but you don't necessarily know what's in the tin, which is why it's very useful to have some of these sort of formal methods and static analysis tools. Um, or, but you know, we tend to rely just on humans to do this kind of auditing right now, and you can still do that. Uh, so what you get, if you have secure libraries produced by a secure compiler, is a secure bill of materials. So this is, I don't know how many people have been involved in trying to uh, ship these kinds of projects at major companies, but you have to use like something like Black Duck or Protex and build like a complete list of every bit of code that goes into any product you release. And in theory, these are supposed to come from known good versions. So if you have known good secure libraries and you create you know, a list that only contains those, you can then build a secure program, which is effectively a program compiled from sources that you, know, you intend to be in that program. So once you compile that in ZK, you effectively have you know, a hash of an image that, uh, that you know entirely what's in it. <laughs> so now that you have that, you can um, run this new program or API. You could imagine maybe this is like a critical piece of network routing infrastructure. Um, you can now run that, and every time the computation, any computation runs, you actually get proof that that secure program was the program that used, was used to run it. So this is, this is where this sort of modality is very different than what happens today. Today, people build these bombs, uh, they compile their software packages, they have some kind of you know, over-the-air update mechanism, they put it on the computer, and then after that, you have no idea what the computer's running until you periodically audit it. This actually gives your computations a chain of custody. Um, yeah, so there's a, tons of applications for this, hardware wallets, network infrastructure, anything where the, like, the stakes are high, finance, defense, secure compartmentalized information facilities, et cetera. Sort of building on this, um, you can imagine, uh, well, there's tons and tons of like, robots gradually invading our life in, in various ways. Um, and. Uh, Having the control algorithms that run these sort of autonomous systems, uh, they could be robots, they could be power grid elements. And so the National Renewable Energies Laboratory, which is, actually has like a test field here in Denver, wrote a paper, I don't have the link for it in here, about why they, they basically are looking for ZK solutions to ensure that the control algorithms um, running on all kinds of power grid elements, so solar generation, wind generation, um, you know, microgrid elements that might be uh, in, your, in your house, that all of these things uh, are actually running the control algorithms that the next level of the grid expects them to be running. And then at that level, you still want to make sure that all those systems, like your substations and whatever, are still running the software that you, know, you expect them to be running. That way, your high-level sort of energy market and regulation all works. So. By using, uh, <laughs> so by using like secure ZK software, um, you can effectively build these kinds of secure uh, semi-autonomous systems. So this applies to like robotics and factories, uh, sadly like autonomous drones in the like defense industry, all kinds of things like that. Um, so I listed like low power ZK hardware as being relevant here because if you imagine a lot of these systems are not going to have like an Nvidia. 3090 sitting in them uh, to, to run your ZK systems. So I actually think that the most dominant ZK hardware in the marketplace will actually be for these kinds of use cases. Now, I think these kind of use cases are like a bit out, but we'll see. <clears throat> yeah, and then people talk a lot about this, and I think we will probably start to see examples of um, basically using code that is audited and you know, some, some third party signs off on the validity of this program to say, look at financial transactions, not extract data unless something's bad about them. So you can basically build ZK regulatory bots, but then you do need somewhere to run it 
where um, you know, the code won't be compromised. So in this case, you know, for regulatory bots, probably you don't want the entire world to know what's in your regulatory bot. You probably just want some number of oversight bodies to sort of know what's in that. And that could be the same kind of ZK oversight could apply to a lot of things, like gambling machines in, in Nevada. You know, they all have, in theory, secure um, supply chains, but they, um, you know, uh, I don't know if they, they always run the, the code they're supposed to be running. And if they don't, you know, there's serious cost to, to consumers. Um, yeah. Uh, so those are the only uh, use cases I got through uh, in this particular version of this deck. But I think there are a whole bunch more out there. Um, and yeah, if you want to learn more about what we're doing at Risky Row, you can. Uh, and I think that's time. Oh, yeah, uh, thanks for the great talk, Brian. Uh, are there any questions? I love asking questions. Yes, I did today. Yeah, I know. Uh, so much, so much to digest. You, you outlined a lot of applications. Could you please prioritize what would be the most immediate thing for us, like companies, um, focus on? Yeah, I mean, there. So that's something I meant to say at the start is that you know, for all of these kind of areas of. Uh, sort of advanced technology that's going to move the space forward. I would say it seems like here at ETH Denver there are multiple teams working on every single one of them. So that's very, very promising. Um, I think, you, I mean, you have to just kind of take a bet on which use cases you think are going to, you know, be the most prevalent and, and then work backwards from there and, and see what technologies are needed to enable them. And I don't, I don't know if I'm in a place to, like, put any bets on, you know, which of these is going to become the most relevant or relevant at all at this point. Hi. Um, could you talk a bit more about the applications of ZKML and how ZKVM can assist that? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I tend to think of a lot of the ZKML applications in terms of content filtering for social networks. So you can imagine if you train a dog, uh, sorry, you train a neural network to recognize dogs, and then maybe you create a community online that you know, only allows pictures of dogs on it. So now you can prove, basically, that a picture that you're going to upload contains a dog and nothing else before you even put that content into a network. So it gives communities a way to um, moderate themselves uh, by setting rules, you know, about what content's allowed in terms of an actual neural network. Separately, you could imagine a lot of, um, I mean, credit scores are, are all, like an example people give all the time, and I think that's probably like a valid use case. You know, you have a bunch of data about yourself that you probably don't want to tell the rest of the world about. Certainly, don't really want a credit monitoring agency doing it, but you could actually run you know, all of your data through one of these ZKML models and effectively produce a credit score that you can prove about yourself um, without revealing any of the sort of data that lives behind it. Um, and that could unlock various, um, you know, DeFi applications and potentially make, you know, money a lot more available across the, across the world. Okay. okay. Um, we'll take one last quick question. I, I think you've been developing this uh, RISC-5 uh, uh, ZKVM for a little while now, and I'm just curious, over time, how has your engineering time spend changed? Like, what are you optimizing now? Where is the frontier or the low-hanging fruit gone? Are they still there? Yeah. So I did, I meant to have a slide about that in, in here. But um, so we spent a lot of time actually engineering, just trying to get the abstractions in the system right so that we can you know, replace different aspects of the proving system. Uh, we're now like finite field independent. So we've been building a lot of flexibility into the system so that we can iterate uh, rapidly as, you know, it's a very quickly changing field. Um, some of the stuff we've been working on most recently that's taken up a lot of time is getting recursion time to be very low. It's really critical for the kind of bonsai network that you, 
know, your latency is gated by how many computations you can roll up. So I think we have that down to like 1.6 seconds per recursion now. But still, you know, 100 milliseconds is the goal. So there's plenty of work left to do there. Trying to get like incrementally verifiable computation done for the RISC-V chip so you can actually suspend and resume um, images as well as uh, split very large computations up into smaller bits and then stitch them all together with recursion. That's like necessary to achieve compute parity. Um, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and then separately building our own, building out our own sort of circuit DSL. We've actually had this in various forms for a while. We change it a lot, um, and we will release it eventually. But it's actually the language we use to write the RISC-V circuit itself, as well as some of these other accelerators. And that's yeah, I think that's it.